There we are. Good morning. How we doing, everybody? Yeah. Hey, so, so glad you are in the house this morning. Uh, if we've not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Brady. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. Welcome to summertime. Uh, what you just saw was just a video clip of uh, a team that went to Central Asia last week. And so super excited for them. On the stage with me this morning is Noah Copeland, who... Uh, Hello. Yeah. You're playing electric or bass today? Electric. I love it. I love it. That's the cool tunes you hear. Uh, Noah was on that team. Many of you know that we had missionaries from these seats, uh, engineers here in the city who felt the call to go and uh, are doing business as mission in Central Asia. If we told you the country, we'd have to kill you. So uh, we're going to keep that private. But the ferals are there uh, doing incredible work. I've got to visit there. It's an incredible place. And uh, Noah and the team this past week went, and there was a missionary conference, yes. and you guys were ministering to the kids, teenagers, yes. so moms and dads could go learn and get coached up and all those exactly. things. So, yeah. yeah. Tell us something great, man. What did God do? How was it? Uh, tell it's us a incredible. cool story. First of all. Awesome. I absolutely loved it. Um, we, we did this thing last year, and so five of our seven teams uh, returned from last year, which was really great because we get to continue. Building what we did uh, last year. And one of those kids is Joven. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Joven. You know, Joven's a teenager, so he's pretty girl crazy right now. If you all remember that phrase, that phase. Um, you know, all his like classmates are teasing him about how oh, every girl he meets is Joven's new potential girlfriend. You know? Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we felt that God wanted uh, us, being me and Tyler, to share our story uh, with the uh, teenagers at some point during the week, uh, which we did. I shared my story. If you've ever heard my story, my story um, is about dealing with depression and living with depression uh, from the Christian perspective, um, and just you know going through that and you know still still having it and still being a Christian and uh, relying on God through it. At the end of it, uh, one of the kids raises his hand, asks a question. It's Joven. Joven says, uh, "I just want to say I was really surprised by the fact that." Um, when you met Tyler and you got married, that that didn't fix it, that that didn't cure the depression, <laughs> which is a funny question, but makes sense considering the phase of his life, right, you know, um, and then some other kids, other teens ask questions, cool, it's all good and stuff, and then um, afterwards, they leave for the day, uh, they all had these folders that they kept all their papers in throughout the week, somebody left their folder behind, you see a folder on the table, oh, whose folder is this, let's open it up and see, uh, we open it up, it's Joven's. And on it is sort of his, what we were calling his life map, which is the timeline of his life that we were writing down. And on his timeline, I looked and I saw he had marked every place uh, that he had suffered a major depressive episode. Mm. I didn't know he was also had depression. I thought he was just asking a question about girls. But now you can see that he, that's what he thinks is going to fill it and fix it. I got to share a story about how that's not the case and how the Father is who we look to in that. So God uses your story even when you don't know how yeah. to do it. Come on. I love that. Yeah, you can give it up for Tyler this morning. No. Noah. Yeah, I always do it when you marry somebody with a, another first name like yours. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. It. Um, first of all, we love you. We're proud of you. Uh, you. Super excited for you guys going and ministering to the ferals, encouraging them. But... Uh, how God, I, you said it there at the end, uses your story all the way across the world, literally, right? Uh, yeah. 12, 13 hours ahead uh, and allows you to minister to somebody uh, that's powerful and that's good. And so I just want to encourage you, keep telling your story, just like all of us, right? Keep telling our stories uh, to the men and women, every man, woman, and child here in greater Austin, wherever we go and whoever we encounter, uh, just to give them hope in Jesus. And so, yeah. So we're going to pray for Joven, and uh, we're going to give God thanks for the Central Asia team. So, Absolutely. Father, thank you uh, for Noah this morning. Uh, thank you for the team that went to Central Asia. We pray that uh, the seeds they sowed, just of encouragement and their story and the gospel, would take root in those kiddos' hearts. Um, God, that for all the men, women, and children that they touched and encouraged, God, would you uh, bring an incredible harvest. And uh, we thank you for the work of this team. We thank you for the work of the Pharaohs and, uh, God, the men and women that you call to be missionaries across the globe. So we adore you, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. Amen. Thank you, sir.
Cool. Hey, uh, again, welcome. If you're new in the house today, uh, we're super glad you're here. We're celebrating our third Sunday in these new digs, and so uh, super grateful for that. Many of you keep leaning in and helping us. Uh, it's getting better. There are new things being added each week. Uh, we're a little bit away from being uh, a little bit away from being complete uh, of where we want to be as we prepare for August and a launch into two services and uh, just expecting growth this fall. And so it's going to be incredible. Uh, and uh, I just want to say thank you as your pastor, man. Thank you for leaning in. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. Thank you for participating. You've done an incredible job, uh, and we're super pumped about that. Um, today, we're blessed. Uh, Scott Kadersha is in the house. Uh, Scott, a good friend uh, for the last, I, I don't know, almost 10 years, I think, uh, met uh, at Watermark, met at uh, Pine Cove, did some life and crossing. Uh, the good news is his better half, Kristen, came today. And so, Kristen, we're glad you're here, too, supporting Scott and walking together. Um, and so if you don't know Scott, Scott uh, is a marriage pastor. He's actually my favorite marriage pastor in the country. So uh, just in yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not the only one, but I uh, love Scott. Uh, Scott has a podcast uh, called More Than Roommates. I think there's a picture there. Uh, really great. If you want to grow in your marriage, uh, you know, download that, follow, like, subscribe, whatever the words are. Uh, those are really good. Christy and I were listening to that yesterday in the car on emotional intimacy. Uh, and so some really good tools for there that as you commute across the city or go on your trips this summer, really, really helpful stuff. He's also written a couple books, um, one uh, called Ready or Not, and then the companion pr prayer guide to that. Uh, he's got a few of those today, 10 bucks. You can pick them up in the lobby. Uh, you can do cash or Venmo. And uh, man, really, really encouraging stuff. What I love about Scott and Kredish, uh, uh, Kristen is potentially uh, they're going to invest in my oldest daughter, who you remember, I told you, there's a hairy-legged hairy -legged boy circling, right? Come on, somebody. Come on. Dad of girls, anybody? Right? Um, they, as marriage uh, ministry there at Harris Creek and Wake, are going to be pouring uh, potentially into my daughter this fall, and so I'm grateful for that. already have done that. So when Scott comes here in a moment, welcome them. Love on them. You're in for a treat today as we continue our parable series. Now, uh, something different around here, uh, because we lost some space uh, with another building on campus, we have two portables uh, that are coming, hopefully being dropped this week uh, for kids ministry and student ministry. So you pray that those things happen on uh, schedule this week. Uh, but our kiddos, man, you can be dismissed now. I believe you've got to treat some Kona ice today. Come on, somebody. No? You guys are lame today. I, I'm going to pray for your spirits of joy that you would enjoy sugary uh, treats. Anyway, kiddos, you can jet. I'm going to pray for us. There will be a video, and Scott will come and share God's word today. Um, Father in heaven, uh, we just thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for summer and the mix of routines and uh, vacations and opportunities to travel and go places and God, just all the things that are going on in our body. Um, I think about the Woods who will get married today. I, I think about um, a funeral that was um, uh, of Nathan on Friday. I think about uh, a funeral this week that will take place. I think about uh, just the opportunity surgeries that are going to go down this week. God, we just we lift up our body. We pray for healing. Uh, emotional. God, we pray for physical healing, some of the things that are going on in our spiritual family. Um, and as God, as we just come to this place today, uh, as we've sung about your greatness and your mercy, as we are going to hear a powerful story about that, uh, would you just speak to us all across this room, maybe just with your hands out, posture of humility and dependence, would you just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning? God, your word says that as we draw near to you, that your promise is that you draw near to us. And so whether we are flying high or down in the dumps today or somewhere in the middle, I pray that you would meet us in the space. God, we need you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you uh, for your love, your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name and all God's people said.
Well, so good to be here with you today, and I'm excited to share a story that still brings hope today. Uh, Brady is a great friend, and it's such a joy to be here. I've been here, I think, maybe this is the third time, and I'm always so encouraged by the body of Christ here and, and all that God is doing, by the team who leads you. I don't know if you know this, the production team prays for you, just cares for you, pastors for you. Uh, what a great leadership that you have in this place. Can we say thank you to the leadership, both those who serve and those who are on staff for the ways they care for you. Um, I, I want to show a picture of my family uh, because it connects to what we're going to talk through today. So uh, this is my incredible family. What'd you call them? Four hairy-legged creatures? Yeah, hairy-legged boys. We've got four hairy-legged boys. Uh, twins who are now 20 and then a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. And then there is the, the, the queen among us, my wife, Kristen. Uh, we've been married 23 years. It'll be 23 years this September. So technically 22.75 years, I guess. And four boys along the way, a male puppy as well, of course, just because we've got to add to the testosterone. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, as Mark had shared and, and uh, Brady shared, we're going to talk about forgiveness today. And it is such a tough topic for all of us. But we get to learn from this text that has been preserved for thousands of years. And it's an incredible story that we're going to learn from. But I'll tell you a little bit of story of my family first. And so four sons, they're now 20, 20, 17, 15, probably eight, nine years ago, seven, eight years ago. I don't remember. We've, uh, we've burned a lot of calories and brain cells since then. Um, but we four boys, two of them are a little more athletic and competitive. The other two are probably more of our gentle, kinder ones. I don't know if I could say that. And so I won't say names if, if I can, just to protect the innocent or not so innocent. But Kristen's got the easier two. I've got the harder two. And uh, she's out shopping with them. I'm with the other two at home. And I'm in one room and they're in another. And they start, you know, wrestling as boys do. And, you know, just getting competitive, playing over some game. And they're frustrated with each other. And, uh, and I hear it start to get a little escalated. And, uh, you know, a good parent at this point would get up off the couch and go, you know, referee and fix the problem. And I wasn't a good parent then. I just said, I'm going to watch this and see what happens. And so I stayed in the other room and watched as it continued to escalate. And the frustrations got more and more and more and more. And at one point, the, our, our third born rears his leg back and kicks one of the twins right between the legs. And uh, it, yes, it, it looked like it really, really hurt. And, uh, and so I watched it happen, and, and the older one comes in the room, and he says, Dad, you know, with that, the, the voice that happens when you get kicked there. Not quite there, but he, he says, Dad, you know, my brother just kicked me where it hurts. And I said, I know, I saw it happen. That looked really, really painful. And so I call the two in the room, and I'm like, tell me what happened. They're both blaming each other, you know, and then the younger one says, he made me kick him. I'm like, how, did, how do you make him? Like, did he take your foot? I, I don't understand that. But finally, they get to the point where, like, okay, we, we need to own our part here. We talk about forgiveness a lot in our home, and so what do you do when you mess up? Well, you say you're sorry, and you ask for forgiveness, and so the younger one turns to the older one, and he says, I'm sorry for whatever I did, and then marches the other way and leaves the room. And so he fights, come on back over, young man, and uh, not names. His name's Carson. It's okay. I've told the story a million times. I said, Carson, tell Duncan you're sorry for what you did, and so and apologize. And so he says, Duncan, I'm sorry for kicking you between the legs. Will you please forgive me? And the older one looks at him and he, and he says, yes, I forgive you. And Carson, will you forgive me for provoking you and for starting the fight? And Carson said, yes, I forgive you. They march off and everything's better. And, and I sat back down and I just said, why are my kids so dumb? <laughs> right? Why is this so difficult every time? Why do we need to have this conversation over and over and over again? Why do we need to always talk about forgiveness? And why do we need to explain it? And why do we say, I'm sorry for whatever I did doesn't work? And, and, uh, and I just like him stewing on this. And, and as the Lord does, he gave me an opportunity to exercise those same patterns of apology and forgiveness with my wife later that day. So she gets back home and we're, we're just kind of short with each other. And I don't know what it was. It was, I have no idea what we were arguing about, fighting about. 
But, but he continues for a few hours. And, and you know, we, we really do have a great marriage. And so it's, it's pretty rare for us to be this frustrated with each other. And typically, I, I feel like I'm the one who's at fault. Uh, and so I am, have a, many, many, many opportunities to ask for forgiveness, to apologize to Kristen. But on this particular day, I'm like, she's at least 51% responsible for the fight. <laughs> I don't know how I figured that out in my head, but it was really clear that she needed to go first. And so it continues like, she, I'm waiting for her. She's going to go. I don't always have to be the one. It can be her every once in a while who apologizes. And so she doesn't. We get into bed. Uh, I'm so mad. I bring my laptop to bed, which is you know not something I ever recommend. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm not saying a word about this. She needs to go first. And she doesn't say anything. She just carries on. And so I'm thinking in my head, oh, this is not TMI, but every night when we sleep, she's little spoon, I'm big spoon, we cuddle up next to each other, that's just the way we sleep in bed. I'm like, I'm going to show her, no spooning tonight. And so I'm like take, thinking of all the ways I'm going to be frustrated, get my revenge. And, uh, and, and then, you know, and, and I'm like in my, it's one of those things where words are coming out of my mouth, but my brain is clearly speaking. It's like, Scott, you need to apologize right now. Scott, you need to apologize. Scott, you need to seek forgiveness. And, and, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm having this little dialogue. It's like the good, you know, the angel and the devil are on my shoulder having this conversation. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. And so we casually talk about our schedule for tomorrow, we go to bed. And, and I woke up the next morning. And I thought, what a fool. Right? What a fool. Like I missed out on an opportunity to, to grow in our marriage and to be humble and to seek forgiveness and I would not do it. And so the joke's on me as I talk about my kids being fools and dumb and idiots for not getting it. And, and it's really tough for me as well. And I'm a marriage pastor. I've been a marriage pastor for 18 years. I talk about forgiveness all the time. And the reason I tell you that story is to let you know that it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what your gender is, how old you are, what you do for a job, whether you're single or married. This is a really, really tough topic. And this is something really small. It's just an argument, and I still couldn't get myself to apologize and ask for forgiveness. And I know this is a challenge for every single one of us, whether you were old, young, male, female, married, single, whatever you do in your job, this is a challenge for every single one of us. And fortunately, God's Word speaks to us on this topic. You are in, we are in the middle of a series on the parables which are stories of Jesus, stories that Jesus tells to illustrate a point. And God's word is not silent on the topic of forgiveness. In fact, it's a, uh, a topic that comes up over and over and over again. And, and all of us can relate to this. All of us can understand what it means to need forgiveness, whether it's our sin against the God of the universe, the perfect God of the universe, whether it's sin against a parent, a sibling, a spouse, a friend, a coworker, we all understand what it looks like to have a debt against someone because we have wronged them. We also know what it's like to be wronged. Okay, I, I didn't look and see when Mark asked that question about how many of you have hurts that, that have been done upon you that are really significant. I don't know how many hands went up, but I know that every time I have taught this, that there are people in the room who have significant hurts that have been done to them whether it's abuse or infidelity or pornography or lies, whatever it is, we can all resonate on this topic of forgiveness. And fortunately, we don't learn about this on our own. We look to God's word to see what it says on this topic of forgiveness. And so if you got your Bibles with you, open up to Matthew 18, whether you pull it up on an app or in your Bible. We're going to look at the parable of the unmerciful servant, which is in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. We're going to see that the, the ultimate point that we need to get out of today is that forgiven people forgive others. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven of everything. And so the right response is to forgive others. And we're going to unpack what that means, what it looks like, why we do it. But forgiven people forgive others. We're going to see that we have a debt that we cannot pay on our own. We're going to see that Jesus paid the debt. And we'll see that forgiven people forgive others. And so the context in verses 15 through 20, there's a conversation on what happens when somebody wrongs you, how do you deal with it? And so first you go one-on-one, -on -one, then you widen the circle, you widen the circle, and then we turn to verse 21 in this parable. And I'm going to summarize it for you very briefly, like a 30,000-foot 
uh, summary, and then we'll dive into each verse in this, in this text. But essentially, there's a king who has a lot of money. He calls in all of his servants who owe him money, and he tells them, you need to pay me the money that you owe me. Well, one of them has a debt that cannot be paid. It's an it's a enormous amount of debt. And the king decides to forgive the debt of the individual. The individual is very happy, and he leaves, and he comes across somebody who owes him a very, very small debt. And instead of doing the same thing that the king did for him, this guy says, hey, you need to pay me back what you owe me. And so that's the parable that we're going to look at. And Jesus didn't like the way that the man responded to his own forgiveness by not forgiving the other. And so verse 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sinned against me? Up to seven times, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Your translation may say seven times, 70 times. In traditional rabbinic teaching, when you, uh, if you forgive, if you need to forgive someone, you'll ask three times. And so that's traditional teaching at the time. And so Peter says, hey, Jesus, check me out. Okay, not only am I going to say, hey, forgive three times, I'm going to double it and add one. And so look at me, I'm so spiritual. He says, uh, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, not seven, Peter. It's actually 77 or seven times 70. And the point isn't like you forgive 77 times or 490 times, and then on time 78 or 491, you no longer forgive. The point is that you forgive over and over and over and over because we're forgiven people, we forgive others. We're to be radical with our forgiveness because God, through Jesus, has been radical in his forgiveness towards us. And so he continues on, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man owed, who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. This just got really serious. Okay, he's saying, you owe me 10,000 bags of gold, and because you can't pay it, we're going to sell your kids, sell your children, everything you have, just to begin to repay that debt. And, you know, and I had to do a little bit of research here. What is 10,000 bags of gold? What does that mean? I'd like that. That sounds really awesome. I'd like one bag of gold. And so, uh, you know, 10,000 bags of gold, a little bit of math. One bag of gold equals 20 years of wages. Okay, 20 years of wages. So do the math, 10,000 of those is 200,000 years of wages. And I'm like, how do you possibly owe that much? What did this guy buy? You know, we're in the land of, of Chip and Joe in, in Waco. Any bears in the room? The, no? Oh, man. <sighs> I will refrain from any comments. Uh, and so... Uh, so, you know, that, I'm, like, I'm thinking of Chip and Joe. Like, the best fixer-upper that Chip and Joe have ever done is nowhere near this amount of money. If you continue to do the math, it's somewhere between $161 million, potentially up to $3.48 billion equivalent of what this guy owes. Again, I have no idea how he got into that much debt. Okay, you may have some credit card debt. You may have some house debt, some car debt. But you, you don't have debt anywhere near that much. And this is where the, power, the, par, the parable relates to us today. Because while we don't owe that much money, I don't owe, I know a little bit of money on our house and no car debt, thank you, Lord. And we've got credit card debt, your credit card bill we pay off every month. But, like, we have very little debt. Thank you. Uh, this is saying there is a debt that is so significant that we cannot pay it. That is like $3.48 billion of debt. And there's no way that this man could pay it back to the king. He can't just go in. If you're an Office fan, there's a great episode of The Office when Michael walks out into the bullpen. And he says, I declare bankruptcy. And he thinks if he says, I declare bankruptcy, that the debt goes away. That's not how it works. By declaring bankruptcy, it doesn't mean the debt goes away. This guy can't go out to the king and says, I declare bankruptcy, you must forgive me of this debt. The debt has to be paid. And the parable is a story that illustrates a point that you and I have a debt that we cannot pay. And we can't just say, I declare bankruptcy over my sin, 
or I, you know, we, we, it doesn't work that way. Uh, we have a debt that cannot be paid. I grew up very far from the Lord. I grew up in a non-Christian home and found pornography at the age of seven or eight, was fully addicted by the time I was 12 or 13, started living out everything I saw sexually as a teenager. I smoked pot, I got drunk, I got high, I, I stole, I did, my, my rap sheet is pretty significant of all the things I've done that were a sin against others or sin against the Lord. Nothing illegal, well, I stole, so that's illegal. But nothing illegal sexually, but just terrible sexual sin. I, I, uh, the reason why it took me so long to grasp the gospel. Somebody shared the gospel with me when I was 22 years old, and they told me that Jesus has paid the debt for my sin. And I said, that may be true for you, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know the sin I have. You don't know the sexual sin I've committed. You don't know the sins that I have committed. I felt and believed deep in my bones that no one could forgive me for what I had done. I realized uh, at the age of 24 that I had a debt that I could not pay on my own. And so we're going to pick up the story, but what is it like to realize that you have an unpayable debt? And the reality is, again, whether you're male, female, old, young, married, single, whatever you do, whether you owe a lot of money or a little bit of money or no money, every single one of us in this room has a debt that we cannot pay. And that's not a financial debt. It's a debt of sin against the God of the universe, the perfect God of the universe who loves us. And so we need to continue reading the story to see what happens to this man and then what happens to our story. What happens to me when I think I've got a debt that cannot be paid? And so it picks up at verse 26. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. He said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything, which again is a ridiculous statement. There's no way that this man can repay $3.48 billion or $161 million. But the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So this is what happens with us. I, I didn't say, I don't know if I said point one, but the problem is, is that we all have a debt that cannot be paid. We have a debt we cannot pay. Point two, the solution is that our debt has been paid by Jesus. Yes. The unpayable debt that we could never pay has been paid in full by Jesus. And this is what forgiveness looks like. This is the king who looks down on the servant who owes him so much money and he says, I forgive the debt. This is you and me coming to the king, the real king, the Lord, and saying, We have a debt that cannot be paid. It requires a level of humility that says there's nothing I could do. There aren't enough good things I could do. There aren't enough behaviors I could do. I, I can't go to Crossroads enough. I can't give enough money to church. I can't memorize enough scripture. I can't read enough Bible. I can't, I, I can't pray, pray enough. There's nothing I can do that would allow me to pay this debt back. And so I am falling on my knees and begging for you to forgive the debt that I have incurred against you. And the king, God, says that debt is paid. It is canceled. It is paid in full. Our debt has been paid by Jesus. And so I want to talk very quickly. I think this is in your uh, listening guide, but, but what forgiveness is not. It's really, we really need to have a good understanding of this. And so we could spend a lot more time on this, but I'm going to go through these. This would be great for you to discuss with your, do you call them community groups? Yeah, great to discuss with your community groups of what forgiveness is not and what forgiveness is. But a few things. Forgiveness is not condoning the behavior or saying it's okay. If someone has, uh, has harmed you in any way, it's not saying that behavior is acceptable and okay. That's not what forgiveness is. It's not denying the hurt and stuffing your feelings or thoughts. Okay, forgiveness is, is not saying uh, your sin against me has not had an impact on me. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not contingent upon the request of the other person. Forgiveness is not granting immediate trust to the offending par party. If someone has incurred a, uh, a, a hurt against you, when you forgive them, you're not saying I'm fully restored to you. I trust you fully. That's not what forgiveness is. You can say I forgive you, but I still don't trust you. Forgiveness is not full and complete reconciliation and restoration. Forgiveness is not necessarily justice, getting what you deserve. And forgiveness is not forgetting. You often hear the phrase forgive and forget. 
And that's just a really false teaching. Because often with forgiveness, there is a hurt that has been, uh, that has been placed upon us that is really difficult that you may never, ever, ever forget. Maybe you were abused by somebody else. If that's part of your story, I am so deeply sorry. You need to know that is not your fault that happened. You will never forget that. But it is possible to forgive. And so what forgiveness is, it's a release of a debt owed. The debt is gone. It is finished. It is paid in full. It means that you no longer owe me anything. Again, I might not be fully restored to you. Trust might not be fully restored, but I no longer hold this debt against you. And when we ask for forgiveness, when we grant forgiveness, it it says that we understand that we are forgiven people. We'll look at that in a few moments, but it requires, again, this level of humility to ask it and then a level of trust to grant it. When we grant forgiveness, we say we trust what God's word says. That as forgiven people, we're going to forgive others. We um, we love, Chris and I love uh, spending time with one another on dates. We, uh, as a marriage pastor, I often encourage couples to go date one another. Dating doesn't end when you say I do. It's something you continually do as a married couple. And so a few days ago on Wednesday, we went to Fort Worth, went from uh, Waco to Fort Worth to see the show Hamilton. Have any of you seen Hamilton? Yeah, so good, so good. And so I'm going to tell a little bit of the story, but there's no spoiler alerts here. This is like 250 years of history. And so um, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't listened to the music, there is a clean version of it. You don't have to listen to the explicit lyric version. It's on Disney+. Plus. It's, it's really an amazing story. And we love the music. Our kids like the music, love it. We've listened to it for years. We saw it for the first time live, I think, five years ago, and then saw it again a few days ago in Fort Worth. But it's a story of Alexander Hamilton, who's one of the founding fathers of America. And you know, the, the lyrics are so good. He, you know, he moves to America, and uh, he wants to, um, he's got these big dreams and big hopes for his life. Um, he, uh, uh, you know, he's helped found the nation. He plays a big role in the Revolutionary War, the founding of our country. He comes to America. He doesn't have any, mo- any money, he, even some of the lines. He says he doesn't have a dollar to his name. He doesn't want to throw away his shot. He meets the Schuyler sisters. There's three of them, Angelica, Eliza, and, of course, the youngest, Peggy. He pursues Eliza. He marries Eliza. And so they've got this marriage. That, you know, he's brilliant. He works really hard. He's young, scrappy, and hungry. And he works really hard to be uh, this formidable part of forming our nation. Well, one summer, one of his problems is that he works a little too much. He's too dedicated to his job and not dedicated enough to his family. And so one summer, his wife goes away to upstate New York with her sister, and Alexander Hamilton stays at home. I can't remember where he lived, but he doesn't go travel with them. He stays at home, and he starts to have an affair. This woman named Maria Reynolds comes by, and he has this ongoing affair with somebody who's not his wife. So that's one big sin. You know, he he sins against his wife by having an affair. He neglects his family, his wife and their kids. A few years later, uh, they've got this son named Philip. Now, Philip is shot in a gunfight, and Hamilton is largely responsible for his son being in this gunfight. And so there's all this weight that that is all this sin that is incurred against his wife. He neglects his family. He has an affair. His son is shot. The wife found out about the affair. She's so frustrated with her husband. And at some point in the play, she says, I am writing myself out of the narrative of our story. I'm done with this family. I'm done with my husband. I'm not going to divorce him. We're going to stay married. But I'm, but I'm done really being a part of it. I'm no longer part of this story and this legacy. And their story continues on. And, and at the funeral of their son, Philip, after he'd been shot, Alexander begs for forgiveness from his wife. And this powerful moment in the play, she actually forgives her husband. And she writes herself back into their story. In fact, after he dies, she gives the rest of her life to uh, telling the story of Alexander Hamilton and explaining and sharing his legacy. And I love the music. I love the dancing. I love the storyline of that play of that show, but what strikes me every single time I see it is her forgiveness of how could she, somebody who has been cheated on, somebody who has not been treated well, how could she forgive her husband? 
And so I actually did a little bit of a deep dive to understand more of her story. It turns out that Eliza is a follower of Jesus Christ, was a follower. She's no longer with us. She died a long time ago. She's with the Lord. But what's so powerful about that is she understands forgiveness. She forgives her husband. The debt has been paid. And not only does she restore with her husband, it's not like they just, like she wrote herself back into the story and she wished ill well upon her husband and always wished bad things happened. Instead, the opposite happened. She marries, she's like, I'm back in the family and I'm not only going to forgive him, but I'm going to do everything I can to tell about all the great things he did. She has forgiven the debt that her husband had incurred against her. This is what happens when we forgive others. We realize we're forgiven, so we forgive others because the debt has been paid by Jesus. The passage continues on in verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Okay, so I got to do a little bit of math again. A hundred silver coins uh, is the equivalent of 100 days of wages. And so three months, uh, so this guy's been, been forgiven of 200,000 years of wages, and then he comes across somebody who owes him 100 days worth of wages. And you think, okay, since you've been forgiven of this massive debt, clearly you're going to forgive this guy for this really small debt he has against you. But instead, he grabs the man and he begins to choke him. He says, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, very similar to what this other man did. He said, be patient with me. I will pay it back. But the man refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. So he's been forgiven of of $3.48 billion of debt, and then somebody owes him 100 days of wages. That should be easy. I've been forgiven of all of my sin against the rest of humanity, against the Lord. It should be really easy to forgive my wife when she frustrates me, to forgive one of my kids when they mouth off to me, to forgive somebody when they say something harmful about me. We rightly understand this. We will easily forgive others. But this man doesn't do that. Instead, he says, go to jail. You're going to pay back what you owe me. When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. He said, you wicked servant. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Point number three is our response is to forgive as we have been forgiven. The man owes a massive debt. He's been forgiven of the debt by the king and he won't forgive others. The king responds by calling him wicked. Okay, so often, this is our story as well. When we have been forgiven of all of the sin that we have committed. And I, I think if we have trouble understanding this parable, it's because at times we don't realize how much our sin has cost. We don't realize the amount of sin that we all have in our lives we often compare to others. And so we might say, well, at least I haven't killed anyone. I haven't abused anyone. I haven't had an affair. I'm not addicted to pornography. I haven't stolen that much. All I stole were a few paper clips. And, you know, I don't curse all the time. I just curse sometimes. You know, I, I only like gave a few people the middle finger when I drove to church on Sunday. Like, we, we think it's so minimal what we've done. I've only gotten drunk a few times. I've, I've only gotten high a few times. At least I'm not like that other person. At least I'm not like my wife, my kids, my neighbor, my coworker, my boss. We don't realize that we have sinned against the perfect God of the universe who has never sinned, never done anything wrong, never committed anything worthy of sin or forgiveness. 
And when we struggle with forgiveness, we don't realize how kind and gracious and forgiving our God is. Who forgave everything that we have done. When I think back on my story, what was so hard for me to grasp in my own story is I said the sin I committed was so unforgivable. But, but at the age of 24, February 13, 1998, is when the scales fell off my eyes, when I realized that Jesus had paid it all for me. That he forgave all the sin I had done, all the sexual sin, all the drinking, all the smoking, the drug, I mean, pot, all that. I had been forgiven of everything. And so the right response for me is to forgive others of whatever they have done against me. That when my wife frustrates me, when somebody frustrates me, when somebody sins against me, the right response is to forgive others. And that's the same for me as it is for you when we realize what we have been forgiven of. And this story, this parable, illustrates this so beautifully. Where we see that this king forgives a man of a debt that he could not pay. That is us. We have a debt we cannot pay. And so the problem is the debt is massive. It's unpayable. The solution is that the debt has been paid by Jesus. And the response is that we would forgive as we have been forgiven. Forgiven people forgive people. And you may be saying, as we close, you may be saying, well, Scott, you don't know my story. I'm so sorry that your wife frustrated you one time and your kids mouthed off to you. And, you know, you say, you don't know my story. And you're right. I don't know your story. Yeah, I I don't know what has happened to you. I don't know what you've done. You may feel like you are uh, somebody who is uh, not worthy of forgiveness. Or you might say, what somebody has done to me is unforgivable. And and I want to remind you of how God treats our forgiveness. And I want to tell you a powerful story that illustrates uh, what it looks like to forgive when something seems to be unforgivable. Uh, Larry Nasser was the former USA Gymnastics national team doctor. He was a physician at uh, Michigan State University. He was the best in the world. Everyone who had a child who was a gymnast who had an injury wanted Dr. Nasser to see their daughter. He was the best at what he did. He could fix any problem. Anyone, everyone wanted Dr. Nasser to treat their child in an injury. They trusted him with their daughters. Well, it turns out that Dr. Nasser abused over 250 young ladies. 250 little girls, 250 of God's daughters. He's been convicted rightly of those crimes. He will serve at least 100 years in prison. It led uh, many people to ask the question, what is a girl worth? Infinite value because our kids are made in the image and likeness of God. We're made in the image and likeness of God. Well, this doctor who had all these gifts that he could use for God's glory and for the good of others instead chose to pursue wicked, selfish desires, no matter the cost to others. In uh, 2018, he was brought to trial. 156 women confronted their abuser. And when I hear his story, my response is, well, seems like he's unforgivable. He's a monster is what I think. It evokes anger in us that somebody who had a position of power could abuse that many people, could abuse 250 little girls. One of the dads, when I read this quote, he said, just give me three minutes alone with that guy and I'll give him what he deserves. That's probably the way I would want to treat it if he did that to to one of my kids. But Rachel Denhollander, she was uh, the first one to uh, publicly accuse Dr. Nasser of his crimes. She had the most powerful testimony to him. I want to read you what she said to him in the trial. In the trial, Dr. Nasser always carried a Bible with him, acted like he really understood what forgiveness was. But Rachel says this in her testimony. She says, if you read that Bible you carry, You know forgiveness does not come by trying to do good things. The Bible you carry speaks of a final judgment where all of God's wrath and its eternal terror is poured out on men like you. 
Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you, you have done, the guilt will be crushing. In other words, if you ever come to this point of realizing the sin I have committed against these 250 little girls, the guilt of that would be crushing. But then she says, I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance. Repentance meaning you acknowledge your sin, you turn around from it, and you go the other way, that you would experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. And again, I say, how could she forgive this man? How could she forgive this monster of abusing that many little girls? And it's no surprise, Rachel is a follower of Jesus Christ. She understands what it means to be forgiven. And so she can look across the way in the courthouse and say to a man who abused her and abused 249 other girls, he, she could look at him and say, I forgive you because I have been forgiven. She has realized that she had a debt she could not pay, that Jesus paid it all, and that the only right response as followers of Jesus Christ is that we would forgive others as we have been forgiven. Jesus tells us this parable in Matthew so that we would understand forgiveness and so that we, as followers of Christ, would carry that message forward to others, that we would be different in a world that is not marked by forgiveness, and in a world that's marked by debts that are owed and, uh, and unforgivable sins, that we get to carry this forward instead and be people who forgive others because we realize that we have been forgiven. I would love to pray that for you and for me today. God, I thank you that you chose to preserve this text. A couple thousand years ago, the words were penned. They were inspired by your spirit and put down on paper for us to learn from today. And if you chose to preserve it, you clearly want us to learn something from it. And so I thank you for this story of Jesus, the story that he told that speaks to us today that in 2024 there's something that we can learn god i thank you for everyone in this room who knows you and loves you and trusts you that you have forgiven their sin that they have sought forgiveness from you and and uh, that they've realized you chose to reveal yourself to them and acknowledging the sin that they have against you and and god i'm so grateful that you chose to forgive them you chose to forgive me not because of anything we have done not because we're good people, not because we've done good things, but you choose to forgive us. You chose to forgive us because of what was done through your son, Jesus, that on that cross, he took all of our sin upon himself. And in that act, in that moment of dying for our sins, we receive forgiveness. And God, I pray that that truth would change everything about us that we would be different than the pattern of the world, that we would be different than those who don't rightly understand forgiveness. God, that we would be people, we would be men and women who forgive others because we realize what we have been forgiven of. Thank you for the truth of the story, the story of Jesus illustrating the point that we need forgiveness and we can grant forgiveness because you have forgiven us. In your name we pray.